do want to introduce um, Michael Sprachi. He's at the front. He's been our um, tech everything. Um, he's a board member and a supporter. So that's Michael's context and you know the other panellists. So let's um, see who would like to ask first question. I just want to build on uh, what John was just saying around making more appointments. Um, again, this is a reflection of some of the challenges we're just seeing in the United States of how can doctors actually utilize their time and, and how is that being evaluated uh, by healthcare systems. So you are seeing large healthcare systems like Cleveland Clinic, et cetera, where it's being um, demonstrated that they're charging for things like my chart messages. Right. And uh, that, I, that is one of the challenges is that that's looked at and scrutinized in a negative light. But at the same time, I view the fact that I agree, if you want to be prioritized, you make an appointment, yep. you can be yep. there. Yep. But that's because a doctor is going to get recognized yep. that yep. I'm doing something. Absolutely, right? correct. Yep. However, that's imposing an undue barrier and burden on the patient. And so I think that what we're going to continue to see is that there is evolution in kind of Center for Medicaid and Medicare to evolve coding charges, et cetera, mm -hmm. that insurances should be picking up, not patients picking up, um, and not doctors working in their pajamas at night. Um, uh, not that we have any desire not to do those things. We want to help our patients, but at the same time, similar to you have lives, we have families and, and lives as well that we would like to um, uh, prosper in. So I think that those are going to be some of the things that are going to be important. And I, the same as you had said, contacting your legislators. Yeah, These are it's also things that legislators have influence over. Um, and so in order for us to have more continuous care versus episodic care, those types of changes are going to be needed. The other piece that I wanted to comment on was the question about the Epworth. Um, uh, so, <laughs> As you know, I, I, I love the Epworth. I think it's just such a no. Um, <laughs> I think one of the biggest mistakes that people make in um, uh, completing the Epworth is the Epworth actually isn't asking you if you fall asleep doing something. It's asking you if you doze. Dozing includes falling asleep, but dozing is a thing that we all do, where I'm reading a book and it's the, it's the fight to stay awake. And so I would invite people especially patients who say, I am a five, because they're going, I won't fall asleep if I'm reading a book. I won't fall asleep. But typically, they will doze. They will fight the urge to go to sleep. They also will sometimes editorialize the question. Oh, I won't <laughs> fall asleep watching a show because I run in place while I'm doing so, right? And so being kind of honest to what the question is yeah. and recognizing it's including falling asleep, but it really is that fight to stay awake. Let's start the conversation. What questions do we have? Yeah. <laughs> but not everyone at once. <laughs> We're going to have to have an orderly type of... So I do have a question, um, the context around this, and it's not limited to uh, burnout by any means, but this is a question um, about how, do you find it hard to bow out of a situation so you can rest or have a nap? I tell myself I'm going to go and do this, but then the situation occurs and I feel such pressure and pressure on myself to stay engaged. It's I think you should one take this for one Caitlin. Yeah, I can take that. Um, I think, yeah, I definitely, I mean, me personally, too, I put a lot of pressure on myself. And I had, you know, for quite a while, I would just kind of say yes to everything. And so I realized, like, okay, you can't do everything. And so I think just, you know, recognizing, you know, when you feel that coming on, like, before it gets to the point where it's so bad that you can't, like, come, like, come back from it, I think... You know, just recognizing that and being like, it's okay to say no to things. It's okay to set boundaries. And I think that's something, it took me a long time to figure that out, but it's helped me a lot in just, you know, being able to, to manage everything going on in life. So. And I think that like, uh, so my wife is the one who has IH and I say this a lot to, uh, to anybody that that talks with me about it. I try to reassure my wife and tell her like, this is basically like for you, you you're disabled because of the IH. This is effectively like your full-time job. So it's not 
it's not fair to think of it as I still have to do all of these things. It's if you were working a full time job, would you also be able to do the things that you're trying to do? If your answer is no, then you really can't hold yourself accountable for, or you can't you can't think of yourself as like failing to do these things because you you have IH and that takes a toll on the amount of time available to you, the amount of the amount of energy that you have, and so you can't just compare yourself to someone who doesn't have IH and who has a whole bunch more capacity from an energy and spoons perspective. Yeah. One of the things that I would ask you also to build on the, the question that was at hand is it's kind of the FOMO mentality that we all have, mm -hmm. right? The fear of missing out. And um, one of the things that I've encountered with different patients is the description that they chose, they're, they're gonna do the nap. But then they go to lay down in a nap and their brain is just doing this. And they're like, I, could, I should just go up, I should just get up and go do that thing. And they end up in an even worse situation because now they went, and they missed the activity. They went to go try to take the nap. Their brain wouldn't shut off. So now they didn't get the nap. <laughs> they didn't do the thing. And now they're there. Can you comment on, do you have periods where you have a similar type of experience? And if so, how have you coped with that or what strategies have you used? Yeah, that's a tough one because, yeah, I feel like that's happened many times, you know, specifically with work where I just feel overwhelmed and then I'm so tired that it's like, okay, I need a nap and I work from home. So I have the luxury of just walking over to the other room sure. and laying down, but then I'm laying down and I'm just thinking about the million things that I need to do. And so it's like, yeah, it sucks because you're just laying there and you're like, well, this isn't productive either. Um, so I think for me personally, I try in like, I think even not taking a nap, just getting outside, you know, going for a short walk around the block or, you know, listening to some music, just something that can kind of relax me and get me out of that state of where I'm like in a fight or flight response kind of thing. Um, and just taking some time for myself and yeah, if, if a nap doesn't happen, I'm not going to try and force it. So, sure. And I think, I think for me, one of the take home points uh, of what you're just stating is it's, it's not too dissimilar. John, you can probably comment on this of how we approach insomnia, right? right. So it's not that you went from having hypersomnia to insomnia, but there is still those innate characteristics that we all have, irrespective of what our medical diagnoses are, that can override the kind of your steady state. And so I would encourage people that if they have those types of situations to also give themselves a timing on it. If I'm not sleeping, if I, if I feel so exhausted, I need to go take a nap and I'm not sleeping, engaging in some of these other activities that either are going to give me a temporary relief and now I can go back and do the activity or that's going to help me facilitating falling asleep. Mm -hmm. I usually say 20 minutes. I don't know. I, if yeah. you can't fall, like if, if you're nap, you're trying for more than 20 minutes, give up and yeah. go do something else because that's it's just not going to happen at that point. So if you set a fixed time, 100%. I think it will help you as a patient then feel like this is it. I've got my 20 minutes to try to fall asleep. If it doesn't happen, I'm going to move on to the next activity and, and whatever that may be. Yeah. And like that doesn't plan mean B. you sit like this. Yes, yes. <laughs> <laughs> you definitely won't fall yeah, asleep. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> What other questions do you guys have? Um, first of all, I just want to say thank you so much for this. Uh, it's kind of mind bubbling for me. I just kind of learn about all of this. Um, so I just recently had um, a sleep study for the first time in my life. And um, for me, it was quite disheartening because it was just like, oh, we didn't find anything. Bye bye. So um, yeah, I don't know. I don't know. Thinking about all of this and hearing all of this, I'm like, OK, can I get a real evaluation on that? Because there's a few points that I'm not sure were done correctly. I mean, I'm not a professional, but. Sure. Um, and also, um, IH wasn't ever mentioned even as a possibility. It was just like, okay, no narcolepsy, you're not snoring, you're fine. Sure. So, like, what can I do now? <laughs> Well, 70, 70 per, this, the sleep study will be positive in 70% of the time for either IH or narcolepsy, which is a rough estimate that I tell. But, but that means if I do 10 of those patients a day, which we don't see that many of, of, of narcolepsy or IH in a day, but if I, and I tell 
all of them, you know, your study is positive. I'll be wrong on three. So three patients will walk out with the wrong diagnosis. Um, so you want to make sure to follow up, say, hey, listen, I, I believe this study was incorrect. Not that, and it can be a personal factor, it can be the lab factor. Many patients will go to the lab and they'll just have what we call a great first night or a bad first night and, and we don't catch anything. So a repeat sleep study is certainly important, but you want to talk to your doctor about what were the reasons that maybe it was negative and you are still having symptoms and that you would get a diagnosis as to, you can't just have a diagnosis as it's not sleep apnea, it's not narcolepsy, you know, it, you know, good luck. You should get some sort of direction, even if let's say it's not those things, and maybe your doctor clinically believes there's something else, they should be pointing you in that right direction as opposed to, you know, hands in the air type of thing. Yeah. What would you agree on? Um, I, would just, I would just add further color to, to the comment around the statistics is that if you were to take all three, the average is around 70%. However, when you look at them individually, narco narcolepsy type 1, so the PSG MSLT, the MSLT specifically, was, was designed to diagnose narcolepsy type 1. And so it is a test that is designed to evaluate your propensity to inappropriately fall asleep. And so when you look at narcolepsy versus idiopathic hypersomnia, a very, very important distinction between the two is that even though we don't know the underlying pathophysiology for type 2 or IH, IH is a condition where you have an over-exaggeration of sleepiness. Narcolepsy is a condition where you have an inadequate wakefulness. And although those sound the same, they're different. They just have a similar presentation. They're both sleepy. So one is I'm not as awake as I should be, and the other is I have too much sleep. So kind of similar to I can slow down in two ways. I can either take my foot off the gas, right, which would be um, uh, your narcolepsy, or I can put too much brake, or I can put on the brake, and that would be your idiopathic hypersomnia. So in looking at the sensitivities and specificities of narcolepsy type 1, if you had no other medications that were confounders, the sensitivity specificity is about 95%. Very, very good. That's if they're not on any other medications that would change the alteration. When you look at narcolepsy type 2, the sensitivity is around 65%. When you look at idiopathic hypersomnia, again, this is a test that is sensitive for inappropriate lapses into sleep. Idiopathic hypersomnia doesn't typically have that. The sensitivities have been reported as low as 12%. On average, we say it's about 30 40%. Now, with that stated, when you're saying the sensitivity, it's saying that I am able to actually capture that the average sleep latency is less than eight minutes and that there's less than two sleep onset REM periods. When you look at what these studies are demonstrating, it's typically not that the average sleep latency now is 20 minutes. It's that it was nine minutes. It was 10 minutes. It was 11 minutes. It's still abnormal. It still is an objective test that demonstrates pathologic sleepiness. And therefore, it is a call to action for the physician or whoever is interpreting it to put it in the context of the patient who is participating in the study. So if I have someone who has a complaint of excessive daytime sleepiness, an objective measure of excessive daytime sleepiness, you are pathologically sleepy and therefore should be treated. And so I make this description because it's very important to understand because as um, Claire has described earlier, I'm very, very active on social media for a reason, because I commonly hear stories like this, and Reddit is a place where I see it tremendously. Yeah. The number of times I've seen people post their MSLT results and be told that they either don't have a diagnosis <laughs> or that they have idiopathic hypersomnia because they have average sleep latency of, of three minutes and one SOREM and are describing cataplexy is mind boggling. And so in order for you to be able to be empowered for yourself and ask questions, you're 100% correct. You need to talk to the doctor and say, explain this to me. Because it's not either normal or abnormal. It is, tell me what these results are. If you're telling me I'm here because I'm sleepy, inappropriately falling asleep, sleeping longer duration than I should, what else are my next steps? And in idiopathic hypersomnia, in addition to a PSG MSLT, the alternative diagnostic strategy that can be utilized, there's two of them, although the insurances typically won't pay for it, is one, a 24-hour polysomnography demonstrating greater than 11 hours of total sleep time, or two-week actigraphy and on average seeing greater than 11-hour duration of sleep, or 660 minutes. Now, that obviously is very important for long sleepers. 
Um, and the unfortunate restriction in the United States is we usually have so many other social obligations that re restrict us from being able to get those. So uh, I would encourage you to have that conversation with your doctor. If your doctor is unwilling to have those types of conversations, I would then encourage you, just as John has said, make sure you get a copy of your results and seek a second opinion. Dr. Corey is available, close to <laughs> <laughs> He's taking new patients. <laughs> with a six month wait. Um, I was just curious, um, how many people here like drove here or live near Philadelphia? Because like we've never met anybody like nearby. So this is very cool. Thanks. <laughs> so I have a question for each. I have a question for each of the panelists in your own, own context. If there were one thing, uh, recommendation, suggestion, improvement, whatever it may be, you could give to, let's say, the general population of those with hypersomnias, what, what would that be to, to best improve their life? For me, I, I always say if you can only do one thing ever in life, it's exercise. So it's not actually just specific to hypersomnia, but um, when, when you have any chronic condition, you already have the deck stacked against you. So you need to do things. Obviously, we're going to go to our doctor. You're going to get medications. You're going to get treated. But if you don't take care of your general health, whether it is a minimal amount of cardiovascular exercise, walking, anything, it doesn't have to be run a marathon. Um, but it is some amount of my, I'm very big on just making sure to get some cardiovascular exercise a day where your heart is beating over 120 beats a minute for about 30 minutes. It's, it's all you really need to do. Um, so that would be me as a kind of a little different than just how do you do, take care of hypersomnia, but I do that general thing for pretty much all my patients across the spectrum. So that's my answer. <laughs> yeah, I would just say it's not let your diagnosis define you, kind of going back to what Dr. Anne Marie Morris's talk was about. Like through this community, I've met so many amazing people that are doing amazing things and we're all doing it like while we're sleepy. So. It's just like, I would say to just keep making those small steps, you know, to, to get where you want to be and really just not, yeah, let this get in the way, essentially, of, of you achieving your, your dreams and your goals. So I have a one thing for the general population, and then I have a one thing for patients. So the one thing for the general population is sleepy is not normal. It's common. So upwards of 20% of the population is sleepy. Uh, so many times I encounter, isn't everyone sleepy? Yeah, sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> but, but that is one of the major contributors to the delays, is that everyone just thinks that it's normal, which is what many of the doctors that you're probably seeing are saying. The thing that I would say is, is a must do for patients would be time management. The reason why I say that is because um, if you've heard me speak before, I usually will say that the unifying piece for all patients with central disorders of hypersomnolence is time is a critical element in their life that they just don't have enough of. And uh, what I would suggest as you're going and creating your progress maps and your symptom diaries is to also look at how am I utilizing my time in the day whether you have a central disorder of hypersomnolence or not, most of us are not optimizing the use of our time. Um, social media sometimes is a big culprit there. Mm -hmm. But that will be an actionable thing in your circle of influence, right? That you're able to change to optimize how you function in your day. I think, uh, like you, I will do one for the general public and one for... Good. Those of you with IH and, and narcolepsy and other sleep disorders. Um, so for those of you with IH, um, narcolepsy, other sleep disorders, it's easy to get carried away with the, the diagnosis. You are so much more than the diagnosis. It does not define who you are. And it, it, you are so much more um, than just someone with IH. Um, it's easy to forget sometimes. Um, and for the general public, they are not just people with IH, <laughs> right? <laughs> yes, yes, but also, but also, I wish for a world that was more empathetic. Be more empathetic. 
Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Uh, time and empathy do not go well with each other. The, the more time you have, the more empathetic you are. But unfortunately, as we all tend to have less time, empathy decreases with time, but very yeah. sadly. Okay, I have a couple of online questions um, that have just popped up. Do you have any suggestions for those with epilepsy and narcolepsy? I can't take Zywave or Waykix because they have the potential to cause seizures when I already have epilepsy. Sure. You, you, want, want, you want to go first or you want me to go first? <laughs> I, I actually had one patient with seizures on Zywave and we continued it. Yeah. Um, I have multiple. Yeah, uh, it's... Uh, this is a this is a question that's very doctor specific, mm -hmm. um, and you have to. And of course, it matters in the type of epilepsy you have, the severity of the epilepsy that you have. Um, there isn't a specific drug that you know catches all. Number one is to get the epilepsy under control with whatever anti seizure medication you can, and there are now. 14, 15, I mean, there's numerous anti-seizure medications. And then you can start to work on the hypersomnia. I mean, you're going to work on both at the same time, but you can treat the seizures with increasing seizure medications or changing seizure medications. And if you have refractory seizures, whoever is listening online, if you have refractory epilepsy, you should be sure to be seen at an, a comprehensive epilepsy center to make sure your seizures are diagnosed correctly and to make sure your seizures are being treated with the correct medication. Then you'll be able to get to the hypersomnia part, which... There are much more limited medication options out there, so um, I think it's a little easier from that standpoint to pick the correct medicine. But I, I have had a few patients on. I, I actually don't have a problem with wake and epilepsy. I just don't think it's actually come up for me yet. Yeah. Um, so several things. So number one, I think that just to take a step back and, and frame out um, uh, the experience that this person is having, it's important to recognize that 40% of people who have a pharmacoresistant intractable epilepsy have excessive daytime sleepiness. And so therefore, there probably are more people who are experiencing a similar journey as us. Um, in regards to the medication management that is utilized in narcolepsy, um, uh, there aren't any of them that I would say are, are necessarily contraindicated. And so there's a theoretical risk with the oxabates. However, if you look at the way, so even though the pharmaceutical companies have to say they don't know the exact mechanisms, animal models definitely are demonstrating that there's a good, better understanding of it. And they exert it, there's effects through GABA B receptors and then cause some stability in it, your thalamocortical with your serotonin, dopamine, norepinephrine, et cetera. With that stated, many of the drugs that we're using to treat epilepsy are actually GABAergic medications. And so I don't have um, any objection to the oxabates. With Wakex, there may be some concerns of, depending on the medication you're on, of if there's similar oh, pathways. Drug interaction, yes, that's true. Um, and so that may be an interaction. Um, there also are theoretical risks associated with traditional stimulants for increasing um, seizures. So the reality is, is that, again, this is not specific medical advice because we can't give you specific medical advice, right. but I would encourage them to discuss with their neurologist um, what their specific concerns are. And I agree with John that the seizures have to be controlled first yeah. um, uh, and then being able to introduce. And I wouldn't do two changes at once. I right. wouldn't absolutely. change seizure medications yeah, and change absolutely not. Absolutely medications. Not. There, there is, especially when you have multiple medical conditions. And I think this is actually something maybe you touched on, or was touched on earlier. Um, when patients are okay or they're stable, they, they often don't want to change their medicine, even if it's one seizure a month or something, oh, but I don't want to make it worse. Um, medical, getting better takes risk sometimes. Getting better takes sometimes a dramatic change to your medication. Um, but you need to do that with your doctor and you need to do that with um, correct and good follow-up when you want to make large changes to medications. But getting better often takes risks and oftentimes we're not willing to take those risks. But that is also a risk that we take. We decide not to make any medication changes. So yeah. um, it's sometimes okay to feel comfortable with what you are and what you know but you, sometimes you can be better with uh, medication changes, but there is, there's always risk involved. Yeah, the only other comment I would make for that person is, is to definitely exercise extreme caution once orexinergic medications come out, mm. just because orexin is a gatekeeper for seizure. Um, and so there's studies that demonstrate that the DORAs, the antagonists, can be helpful for pseudep prevention and um, seizure management. And so even though it sounds counterintuitive for me to say, because if it's a person who is deficient in, narco in uh, orexin, um, just that they should exercise caution specifically with those. Thank you. 
Um, next question. I have IH and I need to lose weight, but I'm so exhausted after, the, after work to go to the gym. Do you have any suggestions? Anything will help. I've personally been a big fan of the new medications that have come out, Wagovi, Ozempic. I know they're impossible again. I know there was a lot of controversy, but mm -hmm. I have seen people in my clinic, especially we send a lot of our sleep apnea patients for weight management. I have seen some patients literally melt away. It doesn't work for everybody, obviously, and uh, but I would say really take a look at these new medications um, that are out and when it comes to weight. Diet management is also very important. I think exercise is good for cardiovascular health and having, uh, uh, having been someone who has lost a lot of weight at one point in my life, for me, diet is what helped me lose weight and not exercise. I think exercise is great for your heart, it's great for your brain, it's good for energy, but to actually lose weight, it really takes diet modification more so, I think, than exercise. The problem with exercise, we often eat back our calories after we've exercised. I'm so hungry, I could have a burger and fries and things like that. Well, I'm not gonna lose weight. Um, so for me, I will tell patients, diet is very important when it comes to weight loss with IH and with any disease. And then number two, if you are really struggling with weight and your BMI meets a certain threshold and you can get these medications eventually, Try to look into seeing a, a weight doctor or some specialist who prescribes these uh, new uh, medications for diabetes that can be used for weight. Yeah. And um, one of the things I'm very privileged of is that I work at a, a large healthcare system in Pennsylvania, and we have a destination healthcare program with what used to, we used to call the Obesity Institute. We now call it Metabolic Health Institute. Um, and so we have a, a comprehensive multidisciplinary program for weight management. And so in addition to medications, I do think it is also important for people to hear that there are surgical interventions um, that can be um, very helpful. Um, and when looking at diet, it's insufficient for us to say, watch what you're eating, look at the calories. Partner with a nutritionist. Mm -hmm. um, uh, although we don't have the science yet to support it, um, uh, there is um, the consideration of whether or not any type of modified carbohydrate diet may be helpful. So something like a, an Atkins, modified Atkins ketogenic. And the reason I say that is we use it very commonly in epilepsy. We see actually excessive daytime sleepiness and sleep patterns improve. The, th the goal of what we're getting to when we use those diets is beta hydroxybutyrate. Um, that's a ketone. Beta hydroxybutyrate is the mirror image of gamma hydroxybutyrate, which is the active component in oxidate medications. Um, and so there may be some strategy around that, but please do not do those types of diets without being under the guidance of a physician and of a nutritionist because there are also potential risks associated with them. Thank you. Uh, one question, uh, well, kind of a double question for each for one Caitlin. of you guys. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, do you guys regulate your daily caffeine intake to battle the sleepiness? And how many energy drinks, if any, do you consume weekly? Not for me. <laughs> <laughs> well, actually, more recently, I've stopped consuming a lot of caffeine. Coffee, when I got on Zywave, it kind of like makes me nauseous now. So. <laughs> I've been transitioning to tea and will really only have like one cup of tea a day. But yeah, I mean, there are some days where I'll have like my middle of the day energy drink. But yeah, just trying not to have them, you know, late at night or in the afternoon. Um, but again, still, I don't drink the whole can anymore like I used to. So just trying to be more mindful, yeah, with my caffeine intake so, so that I can go to sleep at night. But. Yeah, I would say I've made huge strides in that area since college, <laughs> but. Sure, uh, <laughs> I guess as far as my intake of energy drinks, probably more than I should be. Um, I'd say probably five a week if that was your measure. Uh, but I'm also trying to be mindful because I am on, uh, I have ADHD, so I'm on stimulant medication and they interact with each other, at least as far as like from, from what I was told by my doctor, as far, as far as how long they stay in my system when I take caffeine. So I'm trying to be very mindful of that. It's just, you've seen me run around at this event, and so <laughs> times like these, it makes it a little bit more difficult. Um, it would depend on if I'm on call or not. Uh, so this has been a call week, and so there's been more caffeine than usual. Um, but typically, I will, I'll just have a latte in the morning, um, and I don't drink any soda or, um, uh, or energy drinks. Very, very rare soda, but uh, really no, just, just water. 
in college and medical school, I used to pound down a huge uh, iced tea, um, the Wawa brand iced tea, because it was the cheapest one. And I would literally drink that all day long. And then, of course, I would have problems falling asleep at night. I don't know why. Uh, but you had to go to the bathroom so much. <laughs> yeah, exactly right. <laughs> Uh, now, uh, I don't drink any morning caffeine or morning coffee. It's maybe three to four cans of soda a week and no energy drinks. Um, and it'll just depend on how busy the work week is. Yeah. And I, that's usually like my afternoon kind of pickup when, yeah. when I'm slugging it. I have a question. Um, so I keep talking about my daughter. And she's not talking about herself, but I'll talk about That's it. That's what moms are for. Okay. <laughs> so before she went on Sidewave, she tried Sinose and Madap Madapnel and et cetera, et cetera. And they didn't really work that well. And then she failed those. And then they put her on Zywave. And that's working fairly well. But she still needs something during the day. Mm -hmm. And I was curious, you know, can she go back or with her doctor and revisit the, yes. the synergistic effect, maybe between Zywave and Sinose? And does that improve people sometimes? Yeah, so, so that's a really great great question. So although we don't have these studies in Zywave, we do have them in Zyram. And so um, uh, when Jazz was doing the initial studies to get the approvals for um, cataplexy and excessive daytime sleepiness, they actually had one that was um, Zyram and Modafinil. And so patients were randomized to either just Zyram alone, Zyram plus Modafinil, or placebo. And so there was statistically significant benefit of Zyram alone. However, it was even more benefit when you did the combination of Zyram plus um, Modafinil. Now, this is one of the pieces that I would say is, is the art of medicine, is that most of us learn a mechanism of action of drugs when we're in medical school, and we try to forget them as soon as we leave it because we passed our boards. But the reality <laughs> is that understanding the mechanism of action and how you can synergize those in order to optimize symptom control is really important. So when you have your oxabate, that is a very unique mechanism of action. None of the other drugs have anything close to it. When you're looking at your alerting agents and your stimulants, your alerting agents and your stimulants most typically are, are looking at your dopamine system. Um, and then you have one alerting agent that is unique that is working on your histamine system. So the typical approach when doing polypharmacy is looking at not only what the mechanisms are, the length of duration of what you affect, and being able to combine an oxabate with an alerting agent like a sulriamfetol, which for her, since she's in young reproductive age, that would be the option I'd probably recommend because it's not going to um, impact hormonal therapies. And the animal model, uh, the animal data is very, very reassuring from teratogenesis for uh, pregnancy. Um, and then if that didn't optimize her enough, I would then add in um, patolescent because that now has a completely different mechanism of action. Um, and therefore, you're now hitting the neurochemistry in a variety of ways. And so that actually goes back to the, the question you answered earlier of that, why do we want to know about the drugs that you were on in the past? The question becomes, did you fail them? And by failure, we're usually saying inadequate management, or was it a side effect? If it's a side effect, I never want to revisit it, right? Um, or depending on how bad the side effect. Right. If it was inadequate management, hell yeah, I'm going back to it, because now you're on something, you're better than where you were, now I may actually get you across the line. Mm -hmm. Hello. Um, I want to know, and this is specifically to the doctors, how do you feel about um, stimulants that are for ADHD treating IH? Um, my doctor mentioned, you had someone mentioned a book, Daphnil, Daphnil, um, that if it did not work, then he would, uh, Adderall. But um, I feel like that would be something that you could become dependent upon, mm -hmm. even though he said in his studies or in his treating of patients, he hasn't seen that. So how do you feel about that? And also, does the r modafinil make you lose weight? So those are two questions. Well, I think if r modafinil made you lose real amounts of weight, then people would they'd be on it a lot more frequently. Yeah. So I've, I've, I mean, you might, with any, well, let me say this. With any of the medications that we prescribe for sleepiness, there might be some weight loss. So that's kind of a fair general statement. I don't think there's tons of weight loss. Um, but your question for Adderall for hypersomnia, it's used very commonly. In fact, it was what we could only give for the previous 10 years because there was nothing FDA approved for uh, idiopathic hypersomnia. So Adderall and Ritalin and those combinations were very, very common. Um, they're a pain in the butt to prescribe, especially right now, as they're hard to get, they're hard to find. 
the refills you can only get once every 30 days, and if your pharmacy does or doesn't have it. Um, so I've been trying to use less, but I have plenty of patients, I'm sure you do too, who are on these stimulant medications. They are not FDA approved because they're kind of for hypersomnia because they've kind of been grandfathered and they've been around for a while, but there is research to support them uh, for IH. And the American Academy of Sleep Medicine does say that they can be used uh, yeah. for idiopathic hypersomnia. Um, and just to add on to that, there, there's 30 plus different types of stimulants. And so there are um, different ones that are gonna have a variety of benefit. So um, Zebra had presented on one of the stimulants that they're going, that they're studying, and, and that it has a very unique delivery system where it has a delayed release, extended release. And so that's something that can be very helpful for individuals who have um, central disorders, hypersomnolence. Mm -hmm. Clinically, one of the um, treatments that I'll use also is um, Journey PM which is a delayed release, extended release uh, medication as well that you can take 10 to 12 hours prior to the onset of its um, treatment. Uh, and so typically I'll use that around bedtime and that can help with the sleep inertia and some of the symptoms. The biggest challenge we see with traditional stimulants is the development of what we call tolerance, meaning that I've been on it for so long, I now need escalating dosing. Um, many times patients with central disorders of hypersomnolence, we don't necessarily see them become addicted. Um, uh, it usually looks more like a pseudo addiction, which means that I kind of like, I'm hoarding my medication because I don't want to run out of it type of thing. But not that I can't live without it because I'm craving it, but perhaps I feel like I can't live without it because I'm feeling better. Um, and there are some patients who, when they're on these stimulants, because they're feeling better, there's almost like a euphoria, and they get worried that that's a high, but it's actually, I'm just functioning. Um, and so it feels like a high. And so I, I do think, again, one of the biggest challenges when talking about central disorders of hypersomnolence is there's the stigma around the disease. But then there's a stigma around the drugs because of the use and abuse that people without central disorders of hypersomnolence may apply to them. And therefore, we are like, my pharmacy didn't have it. Can you call it into another pharmacy? And then you go to the pharmacist and you're like, do you have my medication? Oh, you don't have it. Oh my God, what am I going to do? And now you feel like people are judging you, right? And so it is, it is important to recognize that the best medication for you is the best medication for you. Um, and so there's no way that we have crystal balls to be able to predict it. Um, uh, and very, very commonly used stimulants. I typically am not using um, uh, many of the stimulants as like my first line. This is the thing to go to. I usually am using them as add-ons, as like as needed, as needed, or where people are needing those little pick-me-ups. Um, and in IH specifically, the short-acting versions can sometimes be very, very helpful to use right before you take a nap. So because you usually are taking longer naps, you take it right before you're going to take a nap, and now that's kicking in, so it helps you to wake up in that 30 to 40 minutes if you wanted to. I thought you were just like, I'm done. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, just one comment, uh, Dr. Morse, uh, yes. about uh, the drug we are developing. Um, it's already scheduled, the molecule itself is already scheduled by the DA as a Schedule 4. Mm -hmm. And the reason is when you take the molecule, it needs to be converted in your lower intestine. So if people, people that are addicted to stimulants, they want concentrations that shoot up really fast. So that's mm -hmm. why they snort it, because it gets from the nose to the brain much faster. Our drug needs to go to the, to the, to the gut. So if they snort it, they don't get, it's not converted in blood, so they don't get it in their brain. So if we are successful, we'll have one stimulant on the market that is easier to prescribe, where you can get it more you know, for a longer time <laughs> yeah. instead of the 30 days with yeah. all the paperwork and so on. Yeah, and that actually, although that doesn't sound like a big difference, it's a huge difference because now you don't have to call every 30 days and wait five days before your drug yeah, is due. You problem. could get a 90-day supply with three refills, and so that is that is a huge difference. It's, it's huge, huge. Like, uh, like the constant struggle we run into is 30-day prescription has to be filled and they don't have it in stock and it has to get to the pharmacy. And what yes. happens if that's over the weekend? And yeah. what happens if I call, like sometimes I'll try and call them in advance, say, I know we can't start the refill process at day 27. Can you at least order the medication so it's there mm -hmm. or so it's on the way? Some some pharmacies will do that, some won't. Yeah. But even with that, like sometimes you run out of medication and it's just too bad. 
Yeah. yeah. It's, it's yeah. a big yes. deal. Yeah. yeah. And I've also seen that part of the reason the pharmacies can't order it is they actually have to reconcile it against a prescription. And once they reconcile it against a prescription, even though they ordered it, and they have no guarantee that's coming in, that now is demonstrating in the PDMP, which is our, our Pennsylvania um, per, like monitoring system, um, as that that patient got that drug. And so that can then also create this whole yeah. downstream. So yeah. It's me again. Um, <laughs> so one of the things that we're running into in the Midwest is that the doctors that we've seen will only prescribe Ritalin, period. And Ritalin doesn't really work for her. So I'm wondering, like, is there a preference that sleep doctors will only like to prescribe Ritalin and won't want to try anything else? Yeah. And I'm just curious what your position is on that. <sighs> I think it's a little more Adderall than Ritalin, actually, just personally. Yeah. But like, I, I think of it like a Chinese menu. There is a little bit of here, there's a little bit there, and you, you can try different things. Um, so I think that specific provider, and, and you will find regional differences across the country as to how physicians practice. They, we tend to train regionally and we tend to stay in areas where we trained. So there is kind of a little bit of a geographical zip as to why doctors kind of all practice the same way in a single area. Um, I, I don't see a reason why you can't change or switch. Yeah. I, don't, I don't have an answer for you as to why that is. Because. So what I would say is that what you're seeing is a, a reflection of what we know nationally, right? So there's about 7,500 sleep physicians in the United States, board certified sleep physicians. And when we look at the prescribing nature um, across those 7,500 sleep physicians for treatments like narcolepsy and idiopathic hypersomnia, we see a huge disparity. So when we're looking at the approach to treatments uh, and looking at the clinical guidelines as how we should be treating central disorders of hypersomnolence, kind of the first tier is going to be alerting agents and um, oxidate medications, and second and third line may be traditional stimulants um, such as methylphenidates and amphetamines. With Zephyr's drug coming to market, that may change some of that paradigm. Now, with that stated, Oxibates are so unique and can be very, very impactful, especially in individuals who have narcolepsy. But I, I would also say, in terms of the IH trial, it was a mind-blowing trial. I mean, it really was, was transformational for these patients. Um, uh, and with that stated, when you look at the number of people who have been prescribed an oxibate between IH and narcolepsy, it's only about 20,000 people. Of those 20,000 people, the number of physicians or the percentage of that 7,500 physicians is about 10% of those. So 90% of physicians who are treating these conditions are so uncomfortable with these controlled substances that they reach for the one that they know is gonna get approved because no insurance is gonna deny Ritalin because it's $5. And they feel safe with it because they're like, hey, a six-year-old can get it, right, um, for ADHD. Same thing is true for oxibates seven years and older, you can get an oxybate. In fact, when they did the Desirum trials, they had demonstrated on the interim analysis that the drug was so safe and so effective that they stopped the double-blind randomized withdrawal period and actually transitioned it all to an open label because they felt it was an outside firm who did the analysis had felt that it was unethical to continue to randomize to placebo. So for me, um, I do think that's a very important piece for people to hear because of the fact, and, and in full transparency, I work for both of the companies that make oxibates, but I also work for all the companies <laughs> um, in terms of consulting with them, so I don't want to make it look like I'm, I'm uh, promoting inappropriately. But I do think that it's important for people who take care of patients with central disorders and hypersomnolence to have that same balance of knowing what is the data that demonstrates efficacy and not just going with fear of that it's going to be diverted or that someone's going to overdose on it or they're going to get high on it or any of these other things. Um, and so that's, I think, what you're probably experiencing. It's a, it's a major barrier that we in the medical side need to fix. And unfortunately, I think the opioid crisis didn't really do anything to help yeah. the, the hypersomnia community because anything scheduled has now kind of been lumped in as yeah. all, all things are bad and scheduled. And, um, it's, it's, been a, it's been a problem, and I think it's more of a stigmatization as well. Yeah. I'd like to add a little bit in from a patient perspective real quick on that one. Uh, you know, there's some guidelines on how to treat these uh, conditions, and if the doctor's not willing to follow those guidelines or at least consider <laughs> those guidelines, you can fire them. Yes. 
It mm. depends where you are in the country. I found this is part of the problem, I think. Is that, yeah. I mean, yeah, in Philadelphia, there, and maybe, there's a sleep doctor every like five minutes. You can, you, there's plenty of us. There, we're, we're, we're like clones out here. But like in the middle of the state and, uh, yeah. you know, the middle of the country, yeah. There's actually 7,300 <laughs> sleep physicians in Philadelphia. But in the middle of the country, you, you might travel hours to get yeah. to a sleep doctor. Um, yeah. and, and it can be sometimes difficult to develop a good relationship if it's all telemedicine. So it can, yeah. be, it can be really difficult. Agreed. 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 Hi. So I have um, narcolepsy type 1, and um, I struggle with sleep hygiene. <laughs> Uh, I think probably everyone in this room could probably say that to a degree, but there was this one glorious period of time in 2020 when I didn't have a whole lot to do, and I was able to go to bed at 10 o'clock and fall asleep with Zywave and wake up at 6.30 in the morning without an alarm and get up and have minimal sleep inertia, which I usually struggle with sleep inertia quite a bit during the day, um, but I didn't then. I would get up and I would do things like exercise and cook breakfast and like, like clean the house sometimes and do my laundry. And gradually things started waking back up again, like the rest of the world, and I, those things I was doing started to get chipped away at. And now I can't fall asleep at night again. And I'm kind of back in the same vicious cycle where, mm -hmm. you know, I, I don't even, I take the Zywave, I don't fall asleep. And then I desperately want a snack. So I get out of bed and then go eat half of a container of chocolate ice cream without really realizing I'm doing that. Mm -hmm. And then it's 2.30 in the morning. So it's okay to take my second dose now. So I do that and then I go back to bed. And sometimes I remember to take my Sunosi when I do that. Sometimes I don't. Um, and then I wake up around 8 o'clock without an alarm because it just sort of works that way. Um, how do I make this horrible cycle stop <laughs> and get back on that healthier, like go to bed at a reasonable time, fall asleep quicker? I know there's really no secret to it, but I, I don't know what to do. <laughs> Sure. So I think some of the things um, that I would just kind of unpack there is that there, there's a component of some behavioral pieces, um, but there's also a component of, of how the medications may be negatively affected. Um, my legs are stuck together. Um, so with, um, with that, number one, even though patients have hypersomnolence disorders, they can sometimes develop insomnia type behaviors, right? And so we will we very frequently will partner with sleep psychologists to help with cog cognitive behavioral therapy for insomnia um, to kind of do some stimulus control and things like that. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Um, uh, I know which list you're on. Yeah. <laughs> in addition to that, um, and, and I'll come back to the behavioral things you can do. In addition to that, when you're describing that um, you wake up and you'll eat something, um, and it's, it's specifically ice cream, um, the oxabates are, exclu are exquisitely sensitive to fat-containing products and then also the pH. So an acidic environment um, uh, helps increasing absorption, and then also um, the fat decreases the absorption. So those two things, you're taking your dose, you're waking up. So now you're, whatever dose you're on, let's say you're on nine grams, you're getting maybe three grams. So you're not getting what you're actually taking. And so that's the reason why the guidance is don't eat two hours before either dose because of the fact that you're going to impact the absorption. A lot of people get concerned you're going to overdose on it, but it's not. It's the other. You're going to underdose. The concern becomes if you eat, 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 and we're titrating you, <laughs> thinking it's not working, and then all of a sudden you have the one that you don't eat, then it'll be too much. Um, so I would, I would say to you that some of the strategies that I use in my clinical practice when I experience things like this is one, yes, definitely doing the behavioral strategies. I like to try to understand what are the difficulties that are, you're experiencing to be able to fall asleep. If, if it is that you go to lay down in bed at a predetermined time just because you feel like that is the time I have to versus the time I'm naturally sleepy, that's going to be the first thing I work at, right, is trying to see what is your sweet spot so that we can take advantage of that. I then will try to look at what's preventing you from falling asleep. I was exhausted. It's the time. It's the right time. But I get into bed and my brain starts doing this. 
What is it doing about? If it's worries, I tell you, do a worry journal earlier in the day. Get your worries on paper. This way, when you get into bed, you can already have done, I've done my checklist. I know that I checked the mail and I did my emails and I did blah, 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 blah. So now you're not doing that while you're trying to fall asleep. Um, uh, you obviously want to make sure that you're also looking at the timing of your eating prior to your dosing, because if that has changed, you are going to take longer to fall asleep. Um, if those things all have been done and you're doing really good, some other strategies that I sometimes will utilize with my patients is adding in other medications to get them back on track. Um, I sometimes will use things like uh, melatonin, but I also will use things like baclofen in combination with oxabates. Um, again, these are things that you would want to discuss with your provider as to whether or not they're safe and effective for you. Um, if I do add those things in, I will repeat a polysomnography. Um, and it can be a home test because the thing I'm looking for is just to make sure you didn't develop sleep disorder breathing. Um, and so those are just some of the strategies that I use, but I don't no, know. No, those are, those are pretty similar. I think the other thing that you kind of neglect is that you went through a psychological trauma in 2020, as we all did. Yeah. And that changes your sleep. I mean, I, I can tell you that when a lot of offices were shutting down, I don't think we got as, we got so many new patients who came into our sleep clinic, whether it was insomnia, hypersomnia, or even the sleep apnea patients decided to come in. So there was a psychological component. There is a, there's a strong psychological component to sleep. And I think that's why I'm such a big promoter, I'm sure Anna is too, about with cognitive behavioral therapy. It's, it's probably yeah. one of the most efficient things that you can do to get it done. The problem is there are just not enough cognitive behavioral therapists available in the country, in the US, in any city. It, yeah, I, I know exactly what you mean. Um, and again, this is something that you can, you can write your congress people about. There's not good medical reimbursement for psychotherapy. There's not good reimbursements for therapists in general. And so many of them do out of network billing and cash, and it's difficult to, to find these patients. So okay. it's, it is part of a larger problem uh, mental health is not well respected in the country in terms of you know medical promotion and it's, there's nothing that seems to be changing anytime soon about it but we we talk to um, congressmen all the time we tell them about this but they don't actually want to hear from doctors they want to hear from patients they need to hear from you you guys have much are a much larger voting block patients are a larger voting block than doctors Hi, so um, I know that for me, mood is a huge, or exercise is a huge thing that impacts me, my mood and it makes me feel good about myself. However, I do struggle to incorporate it due to being struggling to even do my everyday regular tasks. And I feel like it's, it's a very like pick and choose. It's kind of, okay, I pick, oh, do I wanna work out? then I can only work out because it kind of takes everything out of me. So I was wondering if any of you have any like suggestions or advice or anything to like slowly help incorporate it back because it does impact my mood, which impacts my well-being. Sure. I, I would say if you do, if you do, you know, planning on exercises to make that, basically you set your time for your sleep, you set your time for your normal day and to block a specific time. This is the time I am planning to exercise. And it does not have to be overwork. You don't have to run yourself down such that you can't do anything else. You can make it a short period, 15 or 20 minutes. So I would say you make that part of your planned day and that's how you would start it. Just like you plan the time for your sleep, you plan the time you, you go to work. And you're right, you will miss days, you will have life get in the way. If you make it priority one or priority two after sleep, uh, you're, more likely, you're more likely to get to it. Maybe some patient strategies, have you? Yeah, adopt a dog. Um. Uh, yeah, that's, that's actually a great idea. Yeah, that's absolutely. what I did, because I won't walk for myself, but I'll walk for Kevin, my dog. <laughs> great idea. Um, yeah, so I mean, that's kind of what I do is, you know, we have a routine at 6.30 every morning, he is, running to his leash and we go on a 15 to 30 minute walk and then kind of do the same thing in the evening to just kind of wind down in the afternoon. But I think outside of that, for me, I struggled a lot, you know, with maintaining a consistent workout schedule, mainly because I would just try and overdo it and, you know, like lift weights for an hour and then be really sore the next day. So I couldn't, could, like, couldn't redo that the next day. Um, so I think for me, just finding things that were fun, like any movement is good movement. So I think like for me playing volleyball or, 
you know, walking around the park. Like I like to be out in nature, and so just anything that is just fun for you. If you like to play tennis or pickleball or whatever kind of sport that you can kind of incorporate and even like play with friends. I think those are good ways to to just get some movement in because yeah, it doesn't have to be you know lifting weights. Not not everybody likes. One、food. thing that I had started <laughs> to recommend to patients, especially those who work from home, I call it the non-commute commute. So if you work from home, instead of going to your computer first thing in the morning, put on clothes and get out of the house. That is the, one of the best. Wake up first. Should put on、morning. clothes to go to work too. Yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so get out of the house.、Um, do a block. Walk around the block. Ten minutes, fifteen minutes. Start your day off with a little bit of exercise,、uh, as opposed to just cutting it to the very last second to wake up to turn that computer on.、Um, I think you'll find that you're, you'll be more energetic throughout the day. And there was actually recently a study published, maybe just a couple months ago, that morning exercise is correlated with lower body mass index than evening exercise.、Mm-hmm. And there's always a lot of back and forth as to when. Patients with exercise, morning or evening. Yeah. This week it happens to be morning <laughs> exercise. This week science says morning exercise. We'll see what the next study does.、Um, I would go back to kind of what we discussed earlier about those progress maps, right? Start realistic, start small.、Um, I wouldn't even try to achieve 15 minutes. I would try to start with five,、um, because if I get five days of five minutes. I feel like I've accomplished something, right? And so, going to seven minutes, ten minutes, that becomes more tangible. Some other things you may want to discuss is with your doctor as to whether or not are there strategic use of medications so that you don't have that wall you hit afterwards. So that mental expectation that I'm going to feel horrible afterwards makes it really hard. So, kind of similar to you saying, like, I'm going to have that pain. You're going to have that exhaustion, and so many times I'll see that when we get over that initial hump of restarting it, and there's that exhaustion initially, the natural endorphins that occur with exercise start to replace that,、um, and then sometimes people will actually get that energy instead of that exhaustion afterwards. So I would say start realistic, start small, and do things that are are available.、So、like don't go and run and join a gym. I would say, do you have stairs in your house? Walking up and down the stairs for five minutes,、um, or walking around the block, or whatever it might be, so that you can start saying, I've accomplished it. What's my next step? Yeah, in- incremental change is definitely your friend. Like it's. Most of the changes that that like my wife and I have made in lifestyle, if it's a wholesale change, it doesn't happen. If it's an incremental change, especially it's, if it's a small incremental change that snowballs, that's when it's successful. So like, even even like if five minutes doesn't work, try a minute. If if a minute doesn't work, like, like just do one set of stairs, right? Like like it's all about slowly building up and getting there. If you're having trouble doing it. Yeah. yeah, and one other thing to add to that is、um, very frequently I'll, I'll tell patients who have central disorders of hypersomnolence of using a strategy called split attention in, in completing tasks as a way to battle sleepiness. So split attention is different from multitasking. Multitasking is I'm doing multiple things all at the same time. Split attention is I am going to do this task for a set amount of time, and then I'm going to do this task, and I'm going to go back to that. And it also helps people who have ADHD as well、um, in order to be able to actually complete tasks. That also is another way that you can incorporate that one minute, right? I'm going to do this task. Okay, now I'm going to plank, or I'm going to run in place, or whatever it might be, and that may be another way that you can incorporate that. Thank you. We are at time, but I just wanted to thank our panelists、um, and also Rebecca King for her presentation.、Um, so huge thank you on behalf of the、thank、Hypersomnia、you. Foundation and our community and our attendees. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank、Matt. you.